Welcome to the final episode in our intro on Mesopotamian history. We may return to talk more about specific topics or period within this subject matter again, but we will stop our overview of Mesopotamia when it falls under the influence of the Caymanid Empire. The Persian Empire, an Indo-European people from the Iranian Plateau represent a distinct break from the indigenous river valley cultures, and from that point on, different peoples and cultures will come to dominate the region. In its place, the native culture fades into memory until centuries later, Assyriologists unearth ancient ruins and begin to study this earlier period of history. If you haven't listened to our previous two parts, it may be best to go check them out. The same goes for episodes 1 through 5. As we arrive here in our final episode, let's think for a moment about the Assyrian Empire, the one that we've covered essentially in the last two parts, but then its earlier predecessors, the old Assyrian, middle Assyrians, we also covered in episode 5. The Assyrian Empire is interesting because it wasn't obviously the longest lasting period in Mesopotamian history. It's more or less a little over 300 years. It resembles in many ways a more modern totalitarian regime. They're known for their extreme brutality as well as their military prowess. Sargon, Hammurabi, the Kassites, none of them ever achieved the military expansionism that the Assyrians had. Some of these, such as the deportation of enemies, were practiced by earlier kings, though never in the seal the Neo-Assyrians did. The brutal treatment of the prisoners and the conquering and sacking of lands they took by force. That's known. You can see depictions of Bronze Age Sargonic soldiers massacring Gutians. These sort of things happen, but the Assyrians seem to codify them, make them standard practice. It wasn't merely that this greatest military campaign happened once and they had to subjugate them and force you know, humiliation upon their enemies, but the Assyrians had to continuously, or perhaps not had to, but chose to continuously go to their borders, intimidate their vassals, extort tribute from their provinces, and devastate their enemies. The Assyrians have this fixation, the idea of loyalty and oath-keeping. Even in earlier periods, when they fought the Kassites, a number of these wars are shown in moralistic lights. The peace treaty of the two of them were violated by the Kassites, so the Assyrian kings were merely carrying out the will of the gods when they brought this divine retribution on them in the form of a victorious war effort. The loyalty oath would continue into this collapse period. The areas that had been part of the empire were seen as rightfully subject and put back into the empire. Those who rebelled were seen as violating the oaths of the gods as imbibed by the king and therefore shirking divine duty. And in doing so, they brought the most terrible and awful and violent of Assyrian wrath upon them. In a very real way, when you look at the Assyrian state, when you look at the way they had so much of this sort of loyalty and duty and fealty due to the state, and these intense oaths of loyalty sworn to the emperor and to provincial lords in place of the emperor by not only the soldiers, not only officials, but average citizens, and not only by them, but also by the royal household to the monarch, it smacks of this strangely modern totalitarianism. The loyalty oaths are themselves derived from a strong sense of religion the Assyrians are known to have had. The idea is that absolute fealty, absolute loyalty, absolute devotion was due to the god Ashur. And the emperor, being the representative of that individual, being the highest power with the most authority granted into him on earth, he was due absolute loyalty. One could easily look at the Assyrian state and see what they imagine an authoritarian dictatorship of today put on full display in their annals and in their inscriptions. And in fact, there's something to be said about figures like the first Ticulti Ninurta, or Sinatrim, whose own families, whose own states did turn against them because they believed that the monarch had go, gone so far out of the bounds, gone so far beyond the pale in their oath-breaking or their sacrilegious activities, most notably in relation to the devastating of Babylon, that they were able to turn the entire state apparatus and the religious fervor behind this sort of authoritarian, militaristic, divine punishment on the actual king in an act of, you know, not so much rebellion, but in a sort of coup d'etat to replace them and put in a more faithful servant to the gods. By demanding everyone swear loyalty to the state, everyone demand that all swear loyalty to the emperor in some effect legitimizes, justifies, and makes complicit in all these various crimes every citizen of the empire, every soldier, every governor with what the Assyrian emperor does. If these groups 
continue to pay tribute, if these groups benefit from the tribute, if they lay in the Imperial Corps, they in some way are entirely complicit and part of a system which encourages not only the mass slaughter and the violent repressions and the brutal subjugation of peoples and the deportation and resettlement of peoples and also the explicit celebration of it, glorifying their own violent conquests and trying to intimidate all who might attempt to raise the sword against them. To further beat this point home, they did attempt in some fashion to engender some loyalty, some positive feelings toward the state via their various constructions, their public works, the massive libraries, the temples they built, and the renovations they did, museums they had, and the patronage they paid to the temples, and the power structures that existed. In some fashion, they tried to make themselves an authoritative, a beneficent, a just power, while in no way disguising the absolute violence and tyranny that they had brought. In some fashion, it's really a performativity. They showed all these things to the imperial citizens, and the core cities were given all the benefits and wealth that came from the empire. But for outsider peoples, those who they were trying to subjugate or who they were embarking upon vast military expeditions against, there was no performativity. Instead, it was just outright brutality. For the vassals and the various provincial areas, they were offered something in between. The facade of a beneficent overlord entity, while in reality demanding ruinous tribute in order to continue your own subjugation. I had a high school teacher, Mr. Matthews, who talked about his interpretation. The downfall of Siri came from the fact that Syria was able to impose so much fear and militaristic threat upon its various vassals and conquered peoples that dare not rebel. But as it grew, as it had more victories, its population became even larger, and its pool of dissident and rebellious people became even larger. And the percentage of them, compared to the indigenous Assyrian population, simply continued to shrink. And no amount of deportations of breaking people's ties to lands and remaking them into the Assyrian image could compensate for the amount of territory it quickly absorbed. These areas which, you know, the Neo-Hittite states, the areas around Urartu, sections of Iran, and for portions all of Egypt. There were so many areas conquered so quickly by these various kings that it only took so many wars to deplete the manpower reserves. It only took so many horrific acts of cruelty to build resentment. It only took so much ruinous tribute to make enough people decide that enough was enough. And while 300 years might seem like a vast amount of time, as we said when we compare this to Uruk or the early Diastic period, some of these others, this is a blink of an eye. The period in which it goes from the Assyrian height of power when they're crushing all the rivals to the period in which they fall into decline, it's not so different to what might have happened to the Sargonic Empire, what might have happened to Hammurabi, or any of these other figures who we simply just don't have the same amount of records for. Writing wasn't well, it wasn't as widespread, the records had far more time to degrade and fall apart in those years, and who knows what many contributing factors might have led to the fall of those empires. How many different rebels might have had different justifications, or how many dynastic struggles or internal conflicts might have eroded the authority and the power of the king in the lead up to it. The Assyrian system of conquest and repression and economic exploitation isn't really anything new, even in the Assyrian age. The concept of imperialism, of expansion, of creating empires kind of necessitates a certain degree of it. And that in turn actually has its roots in even older ideas. Even a simple thing like being a mercantile empire has the seeds of future militarism in it. Possibly in the first episode, we spoke about why Mesopotamia, why the early Rook-style civilization had an advantage over its neighbors. In its case, it was the production of grain. In that time, the ability to sustain such large agriculture allowed for a more developed government, and that's how they derived their power. Their wealth came from agriculture. Assyria likewise did have a route to power. Initially, Assyria's most telling practice that differs from its neighbors was the founding of the Karums. Merchants would go out from Assyria, found permanent or semi-permanent colonies alongside other civilizations, most notably that of the Hittites, and they would bring wealth back. 
This use of mercantilism and trade and sort of quasi-early capitalism allowed Assyria to actually gain access to rare materials and resources. It increased the wealth of Assyria and its resources allowed it to gain access to new technology, new materials that some of its neighbors would not have access to. Or at least, in the case of more powerful neighbors like the Mesopotamian city-states, gain resources in quantities unknown to other minor powers. However, when we see Assyria actually become more violent, more militaristic, and actually follow an impetus of gaining and holding territory, it seems to be largely as a result of losing those resources. In various cases, either the severing of the trade lines or at times becoming a vassal to more powerful states, but it's a common problem that many large and powerful states, empires, etc. face. When a empire or large nation of some sort is based upon its collection of wealth, its resources, if those resources or that collection and utilization of wealth is threatened to some degree, either via the severing of trade lines or some other calamity or social pressure, external pressure, that empire is faced with a few choices. Lacking what it wants to use to gain and control that monopoly of force, it can either adapt to the lack of it and recede into a weaker state, perhaps dropping from a great power to a regional power or even a backwater nation. It can instead go through a collapse and be replaced by its neighbors, or it can attempt to regain that resource. It's an obvious solution, though, for governments, and especially militaristic governments, things like empires, and certainly like the city states of the Mesopotamia region this period, in the early dynastic period, internationally warring with one another, that when the supply of a resource or trade or the creation of wealth is threatened to to some degree, it's an obvious solution to use the military. Now, in the earliest periods, the military had been to some degree conscripted, but would have still been necessary due to the defense of your city state from other rival powers and like. So, having a standing force of some sort, even if not professional, means they can be called upon. And even if a resource or wealth is not threatened, many powers have seen as a route to expansion, whether conquest, colonization, expansion, etc. Now, of course, in the earliest eras, when we talk about Assyrian Karums or the Akkadian Empire, the expansion is easier because obviously there's not as many large states. But as urbanization, development, and technology progressed, more and more large states, city states, great powers did emerge, and the tendency became for states to use their militaries to fight one another which in and of itself is somewhat of a self-perpetuating cycle because large militaries require expansions of wealth. In this period, it would have also required tin and copper to make bronze weaponry. In the more modern era, things like rubber, oil, etc., all those things require the raw materials, require manpower to make them. It requires wealth to keep the government or the economy via private interests and whatnot to keep running. When you invest so much of that money into the military, then the impetus to use the military to gain even more wealth becomes a thing, and then as you become larger, as we talked about in the Hittite episode, you become a bigger threat to your rivals. You have larger borders. You have more potentially rebellious people. It becomes a cycle of a state adopting some degree of perhaps mercantilism, perhaps capitalism, perhaps simply a trade policy, perhaps early adoption of some degree of colonization or military expansionism leads to a situation which they are faced with the choice of either giving up their gains and potentially becoming so weak that their neighbors will dominate them or fighting for them. And the process of fighting them inevitably leads to further militarism because the process of fighting is costly, it's expensive, it requires you to invest in it, but it also gives you a reason to seek additional wealth to pay off that. And as the expansion and accumulation of wealth, resources, and territory drives these empires to expand, it makes them more and more unpopular with their rivals and their neighbors. If we compare this to the sort of post-apocalyptic framing device we talked about at the beginning of this episode, it's very easy to imagine the Syrians as this violent raider army, a sort of Immortan Joe with all this psychopathic warriors trained to go from province to province and shake down the locals, or else the threat would be, you may not have a kingdom when we decide to come back. If the collapse is an apocalypse, if the Aramaeans rolling through the region and the falling apart of these kingdoms was the destruction of the old world, the Assyrians were the violent, psychotic attempt to rebuild from the ruins. And there's a reason why, even if all of their leaders and all their cities were not turned to ruin, why, even though there is so much left from them, in fact, the amount of writings they have, the libraries they have, the catalogs, the museums that were found, it gives us so much insight into earlier eras. Despite all of that, despite 
despite all we have left of them, the Assyrian memory, the legacy, did not last long after the Assyrians. Not because of extermination, not because of a purposeful erasing of history, but because no one was happy about the Assyrians. While there might be references to their prophecy, while some historians might name them in some degree, while the Bible records a few of the clashes between the kings of Judea and Assyria and the terrible toll they took on them, no one has a nice thing to say about them. When you look back at these histories, Assyria is the bad guy of all these tales. They are, you know, in a real way, to compare it to the modern day, they're a Nazi jerk. They're the evil empire who everyone was happy to see go. Which, as I said, is ironic, given all they did and all these fantastic pieces of art and culture that preserves the Assyrians, as well as some of the Neo-Babylonians, were the apex of that society. Assyrian Akkadian and Babylonian Akkadian were the final version of it. Assyrian religion is so much linked to the earlier version, and so much of earlier history, say the Epic of Gilgamesh, which they preserved, but also just the way we interpret earlier history is so much shaped through the lens of what the Assyrians did. Because the Assyrians, we have so much more of their day-to-day. -day. They have the Limu list and the kingly annals, the histories that stretch for years over the course of centuries some lost, some incomplete, but much more, but there's much more depth to them than we have for any records from Sargon or any of his sons or the Hammurabi dynasty. So much of Mesopotamia really does come from this era, and these kings did do these massive building projects. They did construct libraries and preserve old works. They did conduct scholarly research. In a real way, the Assyrian Empire is the greatest and most long-lasting and powerful of these empires at the end, but its tradition is not one that is ever preserved. Perhaps had a different society been the one to rule for 300 years, perhaps had it been the Neo-Babylonians who succeeded right after the collapse, maybe things would have went differently, but we'll never know. So the Neo-Babylonian Empire is ruled over by the group that we have called the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans are a group that initially arrived during the collapse period. They're a West Semitic people, related linguistically to groups like the Amorites, but they're uninvolved and unknown in classic Mesopotamian history, more or less throughout the entire Bronze Age, there seems to be no reference of them, and they arrive roughly contemporaneously somewhat after the Aramaeans and the Sutians. Whereas the Aramaeans and the Sutians move into the areas around the Syrian Babylon, the Chaldeans move into the southern area, the marshy areas around the coast, the area that was known mostly as sea land, but is also the area that today would now be underwater, given the sea levels rose. So their territory may have stretched further than what would now be today that region, but in all likelihood was relatively considered a hinterland. At the time of their arrival, around 850 BCE, they were not considered a dominant group, and they were not as dynamic or as powerful as the Aramaeans. And instead, after selling the area, they were largely subjugated by various different local rulers, or even Aramaeans who were exerting themselves in the region at the time. By the time of the fall of the Assyrian dynasty, when the Neo-Babylonians were asserting themselves as the most powerful group in Mesopotamia, the Chaldeans appear to have assimilated. They no longer appear to be a foreign force, very different in their customs, like say the Aramaeans and Sutians. Instead, they adopted Babylonian Akkadian style religion, language, and culture. As previously mentioned, they are referenced briefly in the Bible in a few different sections. The first one that I know of is referencing Abraham coming from the city of Ur of the Chaldeans. There is, once again, like so many topics, a bit of debate over whether or not this is even interpreted correctly, and some say that supposedly Anatolia is instead his homeland at a completely different location. But it is interesting to note that when roughly dated, the period of Abraham corresponds to more or less 1800 BCE. That's being contemporaneous to the early Amorite period, more or less not far removed from the time of Sargon and Ur III. That period actually would have predated by some time the appearance of the Chaldeans entirely. And so when you're actually looking at the time of the standardization of the Torah, which occurs during the Neo-Babylonian period and later in the Persian period, you actually have a scenario where they're kind of anachronistically referring to the city. The city of Ur is referred to as a city of the Chaldeans, of the Neo-Babylonians, essentially. When in reality, the period they're talking about, the place of his origin, the Chaldeans likely would have been nowhere near. If the translations are correct, you're actually looking at anachronism. It should be referred to Ur of the Neo-Sumerian Empire, Ur of the Sargonic Empire, but instead, only 1,500 years later, it seems that even when thinking about the ancient past of the Sealand area, these massive empires, these supposedly groundbreaking achievements are largely forgotten. 
In later periods, after the power and grandeur of Mesopotamia subsided and it had become largely an area controlled by outside forces and newer groups, the Chaldeans actually, by the Persian period, become referred to not as a linguistic or ethnic or political group, but instead they had become a sort of societal class or caste. They were known as mostly as scholars and magicians, referred to in records as Chaldean astronomers or Chaldean astrologers. But even this had faded by Roman times. Instead, they referred to Babylonian astronomers. Much later, when the Catholic Church was expanding back in the area, they opted to call the branch of the church which owed its loyalty to the Vatican in the Middle Eastern region as the Chaldean Catholic Church. Largely, this was done because they did not want to use the terms Neoastrian, Assyrian, or Syriac because those were already being used by rival churches. In the year 610 BCE, the dust settles from the final war that brought Assyria down into the dustbin of history. At this point, Nabu Apla Usur, the first king of the Chaldean dynasty and thus the first king of the Neo-Babylonian Empire, is certainly feeling pretty good about himself. Thankfully for him, his friendship with the Medes will last, and the two will fairly amicably divide the borders of the kingdom they have just conquered between them. The Medes will primarily focus on the northern fringes of Assyria, and focus far more on pushing into what they call the Asia Minor, which what the Romans would call it, we call it Turkey. Conflicts there will pretty much capture all of the Medes' attention for basically the rest of their history. This leaves the Neo-Babylonians in an excellent position to reconsolidate control over Mesopotamia itself. In this period, immediately after Assyria's fall, there's kind of a, a moment where everyone realizes that right now is the perfect opportunity to either claim independence from the ruins or to try to reconsolidate some fraction of their empire. Even if the Chaldeans had decided they could never rule the same empire the Assyrians did, that would require war with the Medes, and they weren't willing to do that. It also did mean they were going to have to compete with the Phoenicians, with the Egyptians, and a variety of others who also have similar designs and ideas. Almost immediately, Egypt, under its new pharaoh, Necho II, decides to try its luck. In 609 BCE, an Egyptian army crossed the Sinai Peninsula and pushed up on the coast, defeating Judea in battle, and pushing to the fortified city of Carchemish in Syria, thus putting the wealthy Phoenician lands to their control and cutting off overland routes between Mesopotamia itself and the Mediterranean Sea. It has been said by some that while Babylon could accept no longer ruling the entirety of Assyrian territory, while Babylon could accept the Medes claiming the north and Anatolia for their own, they could not accept the loss of this valuable window upon the sea. However, at this point in history, the first king of Neo-Babylonia is old. He's tired. He's no longer really able to conduct campaigns and lead armies the way a classic warrior king should. And so he turns to his eldest son, Nabu-Kuduri Usur, though we know him far better by his anglicized name, Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar is the second, well he's not quite crowned yet, but he's the second king of Neo-Babylon, and certainly its most famous king. And he is essentially given the command to take the royal army westward and to reclaim the coastlands for Babylon and to teach the Egyptians that the new Chaldean kings of Babylon are not going to accept any outsiders in the Mesopotamian territory. And this is a long campaign by most accounts, but in 607 BCE, Nebuchadnezzar took the armies westward and began to clash with the Egyptians. This was not an easy war. One, Syria is a pretty well fortified region, it's very mountainous, and as the Egyptians had done previously, they are supported very heavily by large numbers of Greek mercenaries who are greatly enhancing the numbers and power of the Egyptian army. It takes about two years, give or take, but in 605 BCE, the seeming stalemate finally breaks when the walls of Carchemish surrender and the great city falls into Babylonian hands. Nebuchadnezzar declares a grand triumph, the Egyptian army is more or less forced to flee and he pursues them south. A series of other clashes were fought over the various months of the year 605, each one a victory, pushing the Egyptians further back, and indeed Nebuchadnezzar's army stood upon the gateway of Egypt, Sinai itself. We don't know for certain whether or not the crown prince had any 
ambitions to repeat the feats of the Assyrians and invade Egypt itself, because on September 23rd of that year, his father dies. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was very well aware of the fact that he had brothers who might have designs upon the throne, but he had the army. Nonetheless, he needed to return quickly. So peace was hastily arranged with Necho. The Babylonian army returned as swiftly as it could to Babylon itself to press the claim of the prince and ensure that he would be crowned as the next king. After all, if he had actually moved into Egypt and successfully conquered it, a victorious general coming back to reclaim the throne from his usurping brother might have been all well and good, but if he potentially was looking at some of the more bloody campaigns, like the Assyrians had to fight during the decline period, he could lose that army. Or he could return defeat, making him in no position to contest the throne. Essentially, Nebuchadnezzar played the smart move of using the military force he knew he had to make sure he claimed his throne. Nebuchadnezzar, who is crowned in September of 605 BCE and will reign until 562, so a fairly lengthy reign, is never really going to have a peaceful one, unfortunately. While, again, the northern border with the Medes is very secure and remains so throughout his lifetime, and indeed into the lifetime of his successor as well, unrest elsewhere continues to grow. Babylon simply does not have the same degree of military power that Assyria once possessed, and does not have quite the same fearsome reputation. The Phoenicians, the Syrians, the Philistines, the Jews, and others, they're tired of being the subject peoples of others. They're tired of paying tribute to the great river valley civilizations. They want their independence back, they're willing to fight to get it, and they assume that the Chaldeans will be a far less dangerous foe than the Assyrians. In this, they're half right. For the most part, Nebuchadnezzar and his successors will not enact the same bloody vengeance the Assyrians love so much, but the Babylonians of this new period will definitely fight tooth and nail to claim this land they saw as rightfully theirs. Unrest, especially among the Phoenicians and Jews, is going to continue all throughout Nebuchadnezzar's reign. And in fact, in the various accounts and annals we have from this period, campaigns were launched yearly into this region to sort of show the colors, smack down rebellious towns, and show the cities that they should not resist the might of this new and mighty king. Ironically enough, this is exactly the same situation that Sargon II of Assyria and every single one of his successors faced. So I guess the more things change, the more they stay the same. In 604, so a year after claiming the throne, Nebuchadnezzar is forced to lead an army back into this region to quell a major revolt led by the city of Ascalon, a city which he orders destroyed for its temerity in resisting Babylonian power. As Ascalon was being supported by nearby cities like Damascus, Tyre, and Jerusalem, he also makes punitive expeditions against them, though they are not as harshly treated as Ascalon as the ringleader of this rebellion had been. But no sooner has these rebellions have been suppressed, and a few years later, in 601 BCE, Egypt decides to try its luck again and sends another army up into Syria to attempt to wrest this territory loose. That war is going to last, we suspect, the next two or so years. There's not a ton of in-depth accounts, no single major battle we can point to. It seems to be more a war of maneuver and skirmish. We're not sure the Egyptians were fully committed to war with Babylon at this point. But after a number of relatively inconclusive battles, a, a shaky peace treaty is reached. Egypt agrees to withdraw. Nebuchadnezzar can claim victory, though it really was more exhaustion of his foes that had won him the uh, war rather than his own military brilliance. But if the campaigns against Egypt and Ascalon had been bad, things were only going to get worse. 599 sees Nebuchadnezzar ordering a campaign south into Arabia. Now, the provocation for this war is a little fuzzier than other conflicts he fought, but the Arabic tribes of this region also had a long history of raiding and plundering across their border into more south lands. We're fairly certain that Nebuchadnezzar wanted to settle the southern frontier, establish a strong border, and teach these tribes not to mess with him. And as far as we can tell, he's reasonably successful in this. Though, while Babylonian armies are tied down skirmishing with Arab camel raiders in the deserts, the first of two major Jewish rebellions occurs. In either late 598 or early 597 BCE, the exact month isn't entirely known, a Jerusalem refuses to pay tribute. The young king of Jerusalem decided that he was no longer going to pay tribute to the Babylonians, though the Old Testament makes reference to the prophet Jeremiah warning him this was a bad idea. He proceeded Retribution by the Babylonians came quickly, and in spring of 597, Nebuchadnezzar led a massive force against Jerusalem, and it took the city after a protracted siege. 
The tribute was then forcibly collected. Three or so thousand residents of the city were taken prisoners, mostly other high nobles, members of the royal family and the like, and a puppet king known as Zedekiah was installed to rule the city in the name of Nebuchadnezzar, thus ending this first revolt and giving the city of Jerusalem a foretaste of the horrors to come, as it were. Zedekiah will reign for about ten years, but in 588 he decides to try his luck at rebellion. This time, however, with Egyptian support, who were giving him weapons and money, and presumably the promises of military intervention if he should come to trouble. Uh, if such promises were made, they were promises that would not be kept, at least not be kept quickly enough. Outraged that this king, who he had installed in power, would dare to revolt against him, to commit the same sin as his ancestors, Nebuchadnezzar returns, and he's determined to teach this city a lesson it's not soon going to forget. Once again, the city is taken in a massive siege, and while there is some evidence the Egyptians had at least considered sending troops to support Jerusalem, they reached their decision too late. This time, the puppet king, Jedekiah, will be captured and taken prisoner. He was trying to flee at the time he was captured by the Babylonian military. According to the Babylonian accounts, they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon, and they gave judgment upon him. And they slew the sons of Zedekiah, and put out his eyes, and bound him in chains, and carried him off to Babylon. With the king would go thousands of his subjects. In addition to this, the city's walls would be torn down, its temple would be destroyed. This is the beginning of something you may have heard of known as the Babylonian Captivity. While this is certainly a harsh treatment of a rebellious city, the Babylonian captivity isn't quite as extreme as legend would have it suggest. The Sunday school version of the Babylonian captivity that most of us probably got was that the entire Jewish population was carried off and held prisoner in Babylon for generations, and how cruel were the Babylonians to do this. And the reality is, is that while many thousands of people were taken to Babylon and forced to dwell in that city as, not exactly in prison, but certainly as prisoners, this wasn't anything close to the entire population of the city much less all of the Jews in the world. This was the king's relative. This was the noble, the landowners, the high priest. In other words, the people who had encouraged and supported the rebellion, the people who had basically sinned against Babylon, as far as Nebuchadnezzar was concerned. He more or less put the 1% in house arrest in his capital. Essentially, yes. And the vast majority of the common people still lived in and around Jerusalem and still you know, tended the fields and flocks. And life probably went on much as it always had, except they didn't actually a king anymore. But the interesting outcome of this is that in a very real sense, many of his modern Judaism actually comes out of this period. It's only during this period of captivity that the various priests and rabbis and scholars actually codified the Torah and wrote down the more or less modern version of the Jewish holy texts and codified their various rituals and ceremonies and the elements of their religion that basically define it to this day. They also wrote some pretty interesting accounts of Babylon itself, which are not the most flattering, as you might imagine, but I remember having a conversation with a friend years ago who asked me about Babylon and mentioned some outlandish things like a child sacrifice, stuff like that. You can talk about the Jewish accounts of Babylon, and the two weren't friends. Despite all of this, and despite the on and off conflict for the next decade, both against you know, native Phoenicians and the continued can't conflicts with the Egyptians, by the sort of end of his reign, last 15 or so years of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had successfully established Babylonian dominance over the western provinces, the coast of the Mediterranean, and take control of the major cities and trade routes, and ensure that those resources would remain in Babylonian hands. At this point, his reign calms down considerably. In fact, there are really aren't any more major camps minor skirmishes here and there, border conflicts here and there, a few rumblings of dissent in places, but no more grand campaigns are recorded. Right? The closest you get to a major Babylonian intervention outside their borders occurs around the year 570, I believe, when the Medes are actually engaged in a major war against the Lydians in Anatolia, and that war becomes so bitter and so protracted and so inconclusive that Nebuchadnezzar is actually asked to come in and meet a peace treaty between them. Regardless, though, Nebuchadnezzar, when he dies in the year 562 BCE, seems to have left a very powerful and prosperous kingdom behind him. The frontiers are secure, the 
Arabians have been contained, the western provinces have been at least temporarily pacified, and relations with the Medes remain relatively cordial. Unfortunately, the Neo-Babylonian period isn't really very long. Nebuchadnezzar's reign is the longest by far, and after him, things begin to spiral out of control relatively quickly. In 562, he is succeeded by his son, Emil Marduk. To get back to that whole, the Jewish accounts of Babylon are kind of biased, they call him Evil Merodach. <laughs> I'm not even joking about that. Amel Marduk only reigns for two years before he is deposed by his brother-in-law. According to the official accounts of this usurper, Nergal Shah Usur, Amel Marduk was a t terrible and incompetent leader who leading the state into ruin, and therefore, for love of Babylon, he had to rise up, depose this king, and of course, take the throne for himself. The reality was, Nergal Shar Usurgan, married to the sister of the king, was a wealthy businessman in Babylon who had been given high office in government by Nebuchadnezzar and had kept those offices under Amel Marduk's reign. He was a man of wealth, of connections, a man who basically had the kind of knowledge of the government and the connections politically he would need to make a play for power, and he did. That's all this really is at the end of the day. But if taking the throne proved to be relatively easy, holding it would prove to be far more difficult. Nergal Shah Usur only reigns for four years. He seems to die of relatively natural causes, but his reign is mostly taken up by him trying to legitimize himself as a proper king and explain why he had felt the need to usurp his brother-in-law. There are some records of him ordering the restoration of temples in Babylon. There are records of him ordering the construction of minor public works like bridges and canals and repairs of the irrigation systems in their major cities. Uh, he also, according to the official annals of his reign, fought a war in the western parts of Turkey against a tribe called the Karindu. Supposedly these groups were raiding into Babylonian territory and thus were a nuisance. Beyond this, there's really not much to say about this king. He reigns for a very short period of time, is moderately successful, but is by no means a great leader, and he very much fails to establish a dynasty. When Nergal Shah Usur dies in 556, he is succeeded by his very young son, Labashi Marduk, who will only reign for nine months. Now, Labashi Marduk is perhaps the saddest of the kings of the Neo-Babylonian period, this child king of Babylon who was deposed nine months after his ascension. According to the official accounts, the high lords of the court, his various advisors and friends and allies, decided that he could not continue on as king. They claim in their own official testimonies of this that even at his young age, he was a cruel and ruthless and despotic creature who would be totally un fit as a just ruler of Babylon. And so they conspired against him, deposed him, imprisoned him, and ultimately had him tortured to death. Which is an odd end to that. Everything else you could kind of like say, fine, you're, you're making your coup and you're trying to legitimize yourself, but then to go take that step is perhaps a bit far. This child is so dangerous, he must be tortured to death. The ruling class has been telling lies and making the general population believe it for the whole of human history. The trick was, though, is that these various conspirators realized after the fact that, one, they just ended the royal line. Because, you know, through his mother, Wabashi Marduk, was part of the Chaldean dynasty. But they also didn't really know, okay, who do we replace the king with? And they couldn't really decide among themselves who they wanted to support. And so they took to arguing over who the next king of Babylon shall be. Shockingly enough, rather than going to war over this and sparking a major succession crisis and civil war, they eventually agree on a compromise candidate. They select a man named Nabu Naib, which the Greeks called Narbonitis, to be the new king of Babylon. And he was an odd choice because, according to some records, he was supposedly 60 years old when he became king. I somehow doubt that, though not impossible that Narbonitis was that old when he became king but he would have probably been in his 80s when he died. And in any case, a man that old is certainly an odd choice to king. However, while Nabonidus would go on to be a reasonably successful king in a lot of ways, he would also be the last king of the Chaldean period. Events beyond his control were already taking shape. It would soon see his empire brought down. So whether or not he's actually 60 years of age when he becomes a king or not, we know that Narbonidus reigns between the years 556 and 539 BCE, and as stated will be the last king of the Chaldean period. 
Much of his reign is obscure, largely because efforts were made after his death to erase a lot of the records of his achievements. And in fact, a lot of the accounts that do survive of his reign are pro-Persian propaganda written after the fact to villainize this king and to justify the future conquest of the new Babylonian town. This is called the Verse Account of Narbonitis, and it, it claims that Narbonitis was a cruel madman who attempted to displace and blaspheme against Marduk and elevate the moon god Sin, his own personal god, the new chief of the pantheon. A version of this, a somewhat mutated version of this, actually survives in the book of Daniel, although in that case it attributes it to Nebuchadnezzar rather than Narbonitis. A uh, version of that event is also recorded in the Dead Sea Scrolls, so that's the way it got around. Which is funny because even if it were true, if it were successful, it's not that different from what the Amorites did with Marduk replacing Enlil and Ishtar in their traditional position. Here's what we know about Narbonitis based upon actual facts, archaeology, and the real accounts we've discovered in Babylon. He does seem to have been very distantly related to the royal line, though again, only very distantly. His father was a high noble. His mother was a priestess of the moon god Sin, which is probably the reason why he was so deeply dedicated to that god. Another little aside here, the reason that some accounts call Babylon the city of Sin is referring to the moon god in this case, and Narbonitis' devotion to that moon god. It doesn't mean Sin in the modern English sense. Well, Narbonitis was indeed deeply devoted to the moon god, and in fact he did lavish attention and resources on building and rebuilding temples of sin, including some ancient ones scattered throughout Mesopotamia. He seems to have lavished the same kind of attention and resources on temples across the entirety of his empire. We know he also ordered the reconstruction of temples of Marduk and Ishtar and a variety of other gods. He simply seems to have been a very religious figure, a very devoted figure in that sense, and if he personally held that he sinned to be his, his, his god, he didn't neglect the others in a sense. In addition to this, he was also intensely devoted to scholarship. He was a patron of writers, poets, historians, and archaeologists. And yes, I mean archaeologists. Indeed, his daughter, Enigaldinana, herself a priestess of sin, would actually organize a, essentially a museum in her own palace which these royal archaeologists filled with artifacts. If Narbonidas was guilty of anything, though, it was that he was not a militarily powerful king. He certainly, as an old man, was not capable of riding with the army and leading great victories. And while by all accounts he didn't neglect the army, he didn't undertake the same grand campaigns that his predecessors had done. He didn't make a name for himself in the battlefield. And this is problematic because at the same time that Narbonitis is establishing himself as king of Babylon and ordering the construction of museums and building temples, a new and much more powerful warrior king is riding to the east, Cyrus, or rather Cyrus II, Persia. Otherwise known as Cyrus the Great. Now, Cyrus actually rises to power around the same time as Narbonitis does, becoming king of the Persians in 559 and reigning until 5. As you might be aware of, Cyrus is very successful in the next few years of history. The Persians who have been living in the eastern parts of the Iranian plateau for quite some time are subject people of the Medes, so they're not an unknown group in Mesopotamia at this period, but they're not really seen as a power player by any stretch of the imagination. They're a vassal state of the far fringes of the Medes territory. But Cyrus II represents a fundamental shift in power inside Iran. He is the result of a royal marriage between his father, Cambyses I, and the daughter of a man named Astagages, the king of the Medes. So through his mother, Cyrus is a member of the Median royal family, and through his father, he is the heir of Persia. At this period in time, the Persians are really kind of getting tired of paying tribute to the Medes, and Cyrus is by all accounts an intensely ambitious individual who dreams of a new Persian empire, and he will have the motive, means, and opportunity to see that done. Interestingly enough, though, it will actually be in a weird sense uh, Narbonitis who ends up signing his nation's own death warrant in a, in a method he probably never would have imagined. Around the year 550, 
Narbonidas had been nurturing a sort of cherished ambition of his own. He had wanted to reclaim the city of Haran, which the Assyrians had once ruled, and which the Medes now had as part of their territory. Why? There was one of the grandest of the old temples of Sin in Haran, and Narbonidas had long talked of wishing to restore it to its previous glory. But the Medes were not particularly interested in giving up this territory and giving up this city. Perhaps this is part of the reason the legends of Narbonidas wind up to place Marduk, it's hard to say. So sensing an opportunity to basically use the divisions inside the Median kingdom for his own uses, Narbonidas actually reached out to King Cyrus the Persian and basically asked for his assistance in a war against the Medes for himself to claim Haran and for, I guess, Cyrus to throw off the yoke of his grandfather and claim his people's independence. Well, Cyrus is down for that, and so he agrees to this alliance, although one suspects he had grander ambitions than that. Of course, it almost doesn't work. Astyages actually gets word of his grandson's little rebellion, and he sends messengers to Susa, the Persian capital, demanding that this young king of Persia come to the capital to make an account of himself and answer these charges of treason. One presumes he would also be quickly arrested once doing so, but one doesn't really know. Well, Cyrus, who definitely was plotting treason, had no intention of actually doing this, and basically sent a letter back saying, uh, yeah, no, and war. And so, really catching the Medes by total surprise, acting far quicker than he thought they could, Cyrus gathered his army, marched westward, attacked the capital of the Medes, and won a crushing victory. Astyages himself is actually captured in this battle, and using his royal blood connection to the man he had just opposed, Cyrus proclaims himself king of the Persians and the Medes taking all of their territory for his own, and essentially crowning himself the Persian Emperor in the year 550 BCE. Acting much quicker than they thought he could, even Cyrus's erstwhile ally Narbonidas didn't know of this battle. And according to at least one legend, the king of Babylon claimed that the gods told him it occurred in a dream. Uh, the verse says, the Uman Manda, which is the Mede in Babylonian, of whom you speak, they and their land, and the kings who side with them no longer exist. In the coming year, Cyrus, king of Anzan, their young slave, has expelled them. With his few troops, he has dispersed the widespread Uman Manda. He, Cyrus, has captured the king of the Uman Manda and took him prisoner in his own country. I don't think Narbonidas had a prophetic dream about this, but whatever the case may be, Narbonidas is probably thinking, well, hey, the Medes have been defeated, like, utterly. Clearly now, I get what I want, how to do anything. But Cyrus, at this point, is like, well, clearly I don't need Babylon, because I achieved all this on my own, and so he tells Narbonidas, no, you can't have Haran, it's mine, and if you want to fight over it, okay. Narbonidas is not really in a position to fight over it. He perhaps comes to regret the decision not to act more swiftly, because over the course of the next ten years, Cyrus only launches more and more and more campaigns. He conquers his grandfather's old enemy, the king of Lydia, Croesus. He takes Cilicia and moves into Syria, capturing the wealthy port cities of the Phoenicians. He subdues the Ionian Greek colonies along the Turkish west coast, and begins to probe both south against Babylon and eastward as well. Indeed, distant parts of the Iranian plateau like Parthia, Bactria, Sogdiana, and even the valley of the Indus River all fall under his control, giving at this point Cyrus control of the single largest empire to at that point ever have existed, and still one of the largest empires in history. Essentially, Cyrus had achieved what it took the Syrians generations to do. Now, what is Narbonidas doing at this time? Well, Narbonidas seems to be playing a long game and trying to gather allies to resist the seeming inexorable tide of Persian military advancement from the east. The Again, the records are spotty just because so many were destroyed after Babylon fell, but he seems to have gone into Arabia. We do know that he was involved in a, at least a one minor military campaign to capture a city. In reality, Narbonidas spends most of this decade conducting various diplomatic missions for various tribes of Arabia. We're pretty sure he's trying to gather the nomads of the desert to join his army and help him resist Cyrus's expansions to the north and to the east. But really, it's too little too late. Or rather, I should say, Narbonidas has some success in this, we think, but it's taking him too long to do so. In the year 539 BCE, 
while Narbonidus is once again in Arabia on diplomatic mission there, Cyrus attacks. Now why? Well, two reasons. One, Babylon was in the hands of really the weak leader. Narbonidus had placed a man known as Belshar Usur, anglicized as Belshazzar, as his regent in Babylon to rule in his name. While Belshar Usur was reasonably competent, he was definitely no match for Cyrus and his generals. And a lot of the sort of Babylonian elite, the landowners and the priests, were to think that, is it really worth resisting the Persians? I mean, they weren't necessarily unhappy with Narbonidus' rule, but he was not looking like he was going to win this war when it came to that. And more than that, Cyrus had shown himself to be a remarkably gracious victor in most cases. For the most part, his troops didn't pillage and plunder the land. They didn't burn and loot cities. And the peoples he conquered were more or less allowed to practice their own culture, languages, and religions as they had done before. Even the Persian tax system seemed to be a much lighter burden than some of the existing tax systems that many of these conquered subjects would deal with. And so there were a considerable number of people in Babylon who thought that throwing in with Cyrus might be the better bet, that Narvanias was probably going to lose this war anyway. So best on Cyrus's good side now, join without having the city attacked, and thus hopefully gain even more benefits out of it. Not unreasonable strategy, I suppose. And indeed, there is some evidence that these so-called this so-called pro-Persian party, to use a modern phrase, actually smuggled letters to Cyrus encouraging him to attack Babylon, saying that he would be welcome there, and in fact they would surrender the city to him. It's hard to say whether or not they would have actually done this because of it. Almost the exact same time Cyrus's army attacks, Narbonidas returns with his own forces. And thus, the war begins in earnest. Narbonidas is successful in reinforcing the city. With the help of Belshar Usur, they actually form a reasonably competent battle plan to fight Cyrus and hopefully deny him access to Babylon. It's simply that at this point, the Persian army is far too large, far too battle-hardened, and far too well-led and motivated to resist it. In this battle, we're fairly confident that Belshar Usur is killed. Some accounts claim that Narbonidas also dies in the field of battle, though at least one Persian account says that the king not only survived the battle and was taken prisoner, that Cyrus pardoned him and made him a satrap or governor inside the Persian Empire, giving him a province in Iran to rule for the rest of his life. It's hard to say which of those accounts is true. It was also not unknown for Cyrus to forgive his enemies and make former kings he had deposed into governors inside his empire. So it's not impossible that Narbonidas did continue on as a Persian official. And if he did do that, and Narbonidas was actually in his 80s, Cyrus must have been thinking, how much longer does this guy even have? While the battle was a failure, and while the city was taken, Cyrus does at least live up to his reputation. The city is not sacked, the city is not despoiled in any way. In fact, Babylon is well treated, it is almost honored. Cyrus marches in at the head of his army. According to accounts from October of 539, the month and year that Babylon fell, in the very beginning, care was taken not to offend the Babylonians, and every effort was made to resettle them in their homes, to enforce law and order throughout the country. The gods of Sumer and Akkad were honored by Cyrus, who took the hands of Baal to the temple. And even the gods of Assyria, once taken captives by the Medes, were returned their temples rebuilt to, quote, the places which make them happy. Cyrus made it known to all that he considered himself and his successors the national rulers, that he worshipped Marduk and praised the great godhood joyously. But to quote the historian George Rowe, we can almost believe the official account written by the Persian conqueror, written in Akkadian, no less, that all the inhabitants of Babylon, as well as the entire country of Sumer and Akkad, princes and governors, bowed to him and kissed his feet, jubilant that he had received the kingship, and with shining faces happily greeted him as a master through whose help they had come to life from death and had all been spared damage and disaster, and they worshipped his name. While Babylon would remain an important center politically and economically in Persian times, and would even have some significance in Hellenistic age that would follow the Persians, in reality, with Cyrus's conquest of Mesopotamia, it really signals the end of Mesopotamian culture as a dominant force in this region. And in the years, decades, and centuries that follow, the memories of the grand and glorious past, the Babylonians, and Akkadians and Assyrians and Sumerians and others will fade further and further into memory until they die completely centuries after Christ. After the Persians take 
to Babylon, and after they extend control and incorporate the Mesopotamian regions of their empire, there is never another resurgent Mesopotamian empire. There are forces which are somewhat from the region, after all the Islamic conquests out of the 7th century come from the Arabian Desert, which is, at least in this area, a connected region. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, have contact and conflict and diplomacy with the Arabian Bedouin tribes, but the Arabian Bedouins are not really from the same culture as these groups. They don't follow the same religions, they don't use the same languages. In fact, the cities that they come out of, famously in that era, Medina and Mecca, but there were others throughout the desert in this time period, are not the same. They don't have the same cultural connection to places like Babylon, Akkad, and Asur, Uruk and Ur. So why is it that the Mesopotamians never reconstitute? We do not see a resurgent Neo Neo, Neo, Neo Sumerian Empire. Well, one of the reasons it's often thought this is not the case is partly stronger neighbors. Surrounding regions like the Persians, and later the Parthians, the Romans, the Byzantines, the Arabs, begin to increasingly exert pressure on this region, and thus one could argue that well, outside force makes it difficult and impossible. But that's not a fully satisfying answer. After all, the Hittite Empire humbled the first Babylonian state, and they certainly come back that. Over the centuries, indeed over the thousands of years since the earliest Mesopotamian city-state, the earliest Sumerian nations that staked their claim upon the land, things have changed considerably. The people living in the River Valley, the people living in places like Syria and the like, they're Mesopotamian geographically, but culturally they're becoming something else. They no longer speak the old languages, they're not speaking Akkadian, they're not speaking Amorite, they're speaking you know, versions of Aramaic, which is an entirely different language. They're still worshipping the old gods in some form, but the average person doesn't read the great epics. They're not educated in things like the Epic of Gilgamesh or the story of Ea and the trials of Marduk and things of this nature. It's a much simpler kind of folk religion. And in the Persian period, outside forces, outside religious forces like Zoroastrianism became much more popular. Well, during the following Greek and Roman period, you know, hybrid cults, early Gnostic religion, even some very early forms of Christianity began to have roots in the world, and of course later the Islamic takeover. So my point is, is that the ancient Mesopotamian Sumerian culture that had been so vibrant and so prominent for so long really isn't a living culture for the time of the Persian. Only fragments of it are still there, and those fragments that are still the culture of the common man are very different than they used to be. The grand histories and the legends of kings, the cultural epochs, the old alphabets and languages and the myths and legends are really only kept alive in the academies and museums and libraries and temples by an elite class of scholars who make it their business to know these things and who were often patronized by the state in some fashion to keep these legends alive. The Persians were at least somewhat interested in keeping old Mesopotamian culture alive in institutions as part of their interesting multicultural approach to empire, but the Greeks, who will follow them, certainly aren't much interested in this. The Romans and the Parthians aren't much interested. The Arabs are not much interested. And the further you get from the source material, the less and less relevant this ancient culture is to living people. And thus, by the time you see, begin to see the disintegration of these outside groups, by the time the Persians and the Greek interlopers fade from the scene, and you begin to see sort of a resurgence in you know, native kingdoms once more, the culture they have really isn't Mesopotamian any longer. It's become a new hybrid. As well, the explanations of outside nations growing too powerful is also perhaps not as simplistic as it first seems. Think about, for a moment, the world that the Sumerians first emerged as the dominant power in. At the end of the last ice age, when a large portion of the coastline, which is now submerged under the waves of the Persian Gulf, was still marshy lowlands and the territory of the sea land, the river valleys had abundant resources and a milder climate. When the world was young, Uruk and its predecessor cultures were building cities in the most fertile river valleys in the region, and the only contemporary large civilizations we know for sure existed at the time were the Indus Valley Civilization and the earliest dynasties of Egypt. As time passed and the world changed, the Ice Age ending mixed with the punctuation of the drought and famine that brought about ends to the Akkadian, Babylonian, and Kassite empires. The river valleys continued to feature many of the largest and richest cities in the world, but was no longer the dynamic and growing center of the world it had once seemed to be. But once Mesopotamia was an urbanized heartland, 
amid vast stretches of nomadic and agrarian hinterlands, its periphery regions such as Elam, Assyria, and the Levant increasingly become populated by sage-dwelling people who form their own states and kingdoms and even empires. Just as these areas were rivaling the old Sumerian and Achaean heartlands, much as these areas had once been mere periphery areas of the mighty Rook civilization, even further flung states had begun to consolidate power through urbanization and through conquest. The Hittites were a powerful force in the region during the Bronze Age, and the Persians were a similarly new and successful group in the Iron Age. But once these massive cities along the Tigris and Euphrates had possessed an overwhelming advantage in population, wealth, and technology, the rest of the world had begun to catch up by the first millennium BCE. Many of the ancient cities are rebuilt in these later eras due to abandonment. As we've said before, the drought and soil erosion had plagued Babylon since the first dynasty, that of Hammurabi, in the 18th and 19th centuries BCE and river changes and general dry periods sealed the fate of what had once been metropolises of the Bronze Age. Cracks were already starting to show a thousand years before the Assyrians began their bloody post-conquest return. Mesopotamia was not growing. I have heard fear-mongering reports on the slowing growth in aging populations in Japan and Europe for years. In modern countries, where we live on the cusp of post-scarcity, and more so in nations with developed social safety networks from the government. Such issues are not nearly the boogeymen they are made out to be, even if some problematic consequences arise. In an era where nations actively wage war and conduct raids against one another, depleted manpower is a serious concern. When Sumer and Akkad ruled the world, all the rivals were on the same rivers or were too far away to wage war against, like Egypt and India. Areas like Assyria and the Levant were regions of nomadic raiders or else sites to be exploited and conquered. By the time of the Assyrians, the world is inhabited by many large, growing empires populated by innumerable peoples with their own aspirations and cultures. This is why the Dark Age truly sets the ancient world into two parts. The destruction wrought upon regions like Asia Minor, the Levant, and Egypt likely caused a shock, which when joined with the cataclysmic earthquakes of those years and the 300-year drought meant the highly sophisticated and built-up systems could not respond. The collapse made all large-scale coordination impossible and allowed for new powers to arise in the gaps left by shrinking and collapsing empires. But Sargon's empire had fallen, and so had Hammurabi's. Yet even in the Assyrian period, special significance was placed on Babylon, and Sargon II's name harkens back to the original Akkadian, even if he was referencing the earlier Assyrian king. There is a noticeable split from that tradition after the Assyrians and Neo-Babylonians, and I would argue is due to the Assyrians. So much of what we know of old Sumerian and Akkadian people in history comes from the Assyrians. To some degree, we look at how they depict themselves and their world, and we project it backward on these earlier groups, filling in the gaps by what is better known about their successors, and also in much of what they preserve in their own libraries. The Assyrians were heirs to these civilizations, but inevitably they must have been different. Thousands of years have passed, and numerous events had occurred. In fact, it is not impossible to imagine many events changing these civilizations in ways we simply cannot see. The Gutian dynasty of Sumer, seen mostly as outsiders and invaders, ruled after Sargon's empire for 150 years, about half the total time of the Neo-Assyrians, barely shorter than the period of the Akkadian Empire itself. Perhaps Sumerian civilization was, in some fashion, fundamentally changed by the Gutians in a way that will never be recognized due to the time and lack of records to compare. During the Uruk period, lasting nearly a thousand years, how much might the peoples of the urbanized center change in comparison to the rural forefathers, and likewise impose their culture upon their indigenous cousins of the sea land and the upper river valleys? The best examples we have are the final ones, and it would seem Assyria did more than any other to change what societies came before it. In this violent era after the collapse, Assyria seems to, to resort to the most brutal methods it could to hold on to power. Not only the savage destruction of rebels and cities, not only the glorifying of their own psychotic behaviors, but in the scattering of peoples in attempting to break the ties to the land. This is a more forward-thinking policy than it seems, to disrupt and change people's culture while also moving them to a new place and putting them at the mercy of the Assyrian state must have been unspeakably terrifying 
and demoralizing on a personal level. But without sufficient infrastructure and ability to rebel, these populations were pacified and ultimately broken into a new Assyrian identity. It's almost a multicultural fascism. They used a totalitarian state backed by a massive military to create a new state identity, which all people must be part of, rather than a racial purity theory like the Nazis. While this did boost Assyrian numbers and strength to some degree, and perhaps it might have made otherwise impossible reigns last longer and preserved the bloody hands of the state, it seems likely that such practices did more to undermine the final longevity of Mesopotamian culture than anything. In this new, post-Assyrian world, large swaths of the people had been moved about and assimilated. New languages and religions had been adopted, and ultimately, little mattered when compared to the constant state of Assyrian warfare funded by tribute. Assyria did not seem to be concerned about what gods people worshipped or what language they spoke. They wanted loyalty, and nothing meant loyalty more than treasure and soldiers for their wars. The vast size and unspeakable brutality of Assyria not only contributed to the disintegration of communities, but actually encouraged it to a degree. When the mighty military of Assyria was defeated, Neo Babylon attempted to impose itself once more on these regions, but the old imperial core, the Assyrian cities, which all these subject peoples and displaced nations owed allegiance, were devastated, and Babylonia did not command the same fear that Ashur Nasser Paul's dynasty did. With so many of these people having been uprooted and moved around the empire, the ties of land and blood likely were not nearly as important and to families and populations told to be Assyrian and given little choice, it might have felt no different when they suddenly became Persian. What would Sippar identity mean to people from the Alartu mountain region or the Arabian deserts forced to live within its walls? Would Aramaeans or Kassites forcibly settled into a city like Mari care little or not at all about the ancient history of the Shakanaku dynasty? Like small businesses crushed down by massive monopolies, what sort of regional identities or lasting legacies could be made by minor cities and lesser sites when the Assyrians or the Chaldeans were building massive empires as other neighboring regions were swallowed up by the Egyptians, Persians, Scythians, and other powerful groups. Babylon had rose up from a minor settlement in Akkadian days. The Assyrians had originated as a tribal people traveling to distant lands and founding Karum trading centers before becoming a military powerhouse after overthrowing their Mitanni overlords. Where was left untouched by the great empires? What piece of desert was not controlled by Aramean or Bedouin tribes? Were there any steppes or foothills not controlled by the Urartans or the Scythians and their clients? The Iranian plateau had gone from vast stretches divided between the Zagros tribes, Proto-Persian and Median peoples in their prehistory, and the Sea of Elam, now transformed into the mighty empire of Cyrus. Old cities like Babylon and Elam had been sacked and desecrated by the Assyrians. The Maya Egyptians had been weakened by the Sea People before being taken fully by Assyria. All which had been holy had been violated, and the mighty and untouchable empires of ages past had been defeated and brought low. The Bronze Age collapse was the crashing blow which broke the old order. Forces like the Assyrians and the Neo-Babylonians, while I compare them to raider armies, were in their own time the most changing forces possible for the region. Their violent successes and dramatic failure set the stage for the disintegration of cultural identity. With this change, the Middle East was becoming a new, more pliable place. In addition to the migrants who had arrived during the collapse, both the Lamu tribes and the resettled sea peoples, in addition to the old cultures spending centuries reverting to more simplistic ways and having to relearn their progress throughout the region, in addition to the violent reshuffling of power and the hegemonic imperialism of Neo-Assyria and Neo-Babylon, the old monolithic ideas were fading and the dominant culture of a thousand years was becoming replaced by outside ideas. In time, Time, however, these new hybrid cultures would come about due both to outsiders like the Greeks and Persians, but also native forces. It is not a stretch to say that without the Bronze Age collapse and the falling empires, the world in which Christianity and Islam emerged and took hold would not have been possible. The forces that have been shaping the Western and Islamic world since the Dark Ages have a real origin point in this period, which the truly ancient world faded away and was replaced by the one of classical antiquity. There is a question I have pondered for some time, 
As has been said, much of what we understand about these ancient peoples comes from what their later successor cultures, later Babylonian dynasties and the Neo-Assyrians, said about them. In fact, if not for these groups, if, say, a different set of circumstances had somehow shifted control of the region to a different outside power like the Hittites or the Egyptians or the space alien Anunnaki or whatever, how much less might we know about these peoples? By comparison, this should give us some idea of how other cultures have been forgotten and lost to our modern memory. There are massive ancient sites which seem to be disconnected from later neighboring cultures to some degree. Lost people who we know so little about, their language is lost to time, never having been recorded or else written in scripts still not deciphered by modern scholars. Ancient sites like Gobekli Tepe and Chatal Hayuk in Asia Minor. The Neolithic sites of the Kurgans like Kamyana Mayala in the Ukraine and the possibly very ancient but certainly not well understood location of Gungyung Padang in Indonesia and the massive underground temples of Malta were inhabited many lifetimes ago by people so far separated from us. People who dwelt in more primitive and harsh worlds. People who lived without the knowledge of the wider world or comprehension of many of the world's natural phenomena we have now studied. And yet these were still humans who had their own cultures, languages, beliefs, and interpersonal connections. It's from ancient superstitious cultures that all human progress initially arises. From the Stone Age hunter-gatherer eventually comes the urbanized agricultural peoples. In the course of many centuries, these people inevitably created complex societies and further expanded their reach via building more settlements and the inevitability of birth rates. Even when we have the words of the Sumerians and their keen successors, how much do we still truly understand? We have a very analogous situation in our own history. Our society in the West very much rose from the ashes of the fall of Rome, and we still use Latin and Greek in scientific and religious contexts. Much of the Assyrians would do with their own historical languages, Akkadian and Sumerian, while preferring the more dynamic Aramean during the day-to-day. -day. The way the Romans spread throughout the Mediterranean and brought many people under their heel while imposing their own culture is not unlike the way the Assyrians painted ever-expanding borders across the map with the blood from a sword. In their case, the Dark Age and the Sea People being replaced by the chaotic state of the Alexandrian successor states, fighting over the scraps of the once mighty Persian, Egyptian, and Macedonian empires. When we reflect upon the Romans, we know a great deal, up to the consular reigns and names and down again to the lewd graffiti left in their wake. But to us, the world of the Roman Empire and Republic is far, far away. Their statues are preserved in our museums, and we study their writings and histories in school. Much of the Assyrians and Babylonians seem to have done with their earlier cultures. The modern world looks back to the Romans and the Greeks and their contemporaries as strangely modern, hauntingly like us, in their successes and their failures, but they still lay so far away that they are considered ancient history. A people bygone who viewed the older Spartan and Athenian civilizations as long ago distant expressions of a linked culture. And yet, Sparta and Athens are themselves only a fairly late expression of Greek culture. They emerge much later than these we have spoken of. Five centuries separate the Bronze Age collapse from the Persian Wars. The Minoan and Mycenaean cultures had existed for centuries prior, alongside the earlier Babylonian and Assyrian empires, who themselves were looking back at older precursor civilizations. These people, who were themselves living in a time before our classical antiquity, had their own classical antiquity. Only at the end of this cycle, as the Mesopotamian cultures are entering the winter of their ascendancy, do we begin to see the powerful entities which play a part in our more familiar histories, the Scythians and the Persians to name a few. But by the time of Caesar, these powers are almost universally humbled into minor states or else replaced by newer cultures who defeated or incorporated them. The way we imagine Imagine the Romans ourselves, even as unbiased and clear-minded in our interpretations as we tell ourselves we are. Surely we must be somewhat incorrect, somewhat influenced by how we see ourselves or how we've been taught history by previous generations who had their own ideas or who might have still been influenced by the generation before them when they passed along that knowledge. In some fashion, that may be why these ancient people seem so different. We have a distinct tradition of interpretation, studying, and thought of ancient groups like the Greeks and the Romans. The medieval and renaissance world had knowledge of these people, and much of our thought is built upon their framework. 
But to see these older civilizations, we either look directly to what the Sumerians had to say themselves or what the also very old Assyrians believed about them. They are a halfway entity. The Mesopotamians lay somewhere between these ancient cultures and histories we have a strong societal memory of who we in some way tie our own cultural mythos to and that of civilizations lost entirely to us whose remaining works lie as silent reminders of what has been but whose words may never reach our ears. We know of them, and we can learn much, but in a fashion they are forever disconnected. No society extant in the year 2020 fashions itself as a direct successor or inheritor to these people. In fact, one of the last ones to do so was Saddam Hussein. His regime, now 16 years toppled, and even then, his efforts were rarely seen as sincere or altruistic. The Mesopotamians are a fascinating people whose fingerprints can be found if one goes looking, but in an undeniable way are from a world so far removed that we collectively as humanity forgot them for nearly 2,000 years. We have now reached the end of part 3 of episode 6 of our series on Mesopotamia. That means our main journey through Mesopotamian cultures is finished. It's been a decently long journey to this point, folks. We started the series in July of 2019. Now it's January 2020, as of this recording. We've learned some lessons along the way about how to make recordings and videos. They even applied one or two. Even if you're one of the rare people watching our series all the way back through now, thanks for showing up and checking us out early. If you come along this at some later date, welcome anyway, and thanks for checking out our rough beginnings. We're glad that people here seem to already be enjoying these, and we hope to keep doing it and getting better. We very well may return to Mesopotamia again, and speak again in greater depth in some fashion, but for now, I think we'll be moving on to new topics. Our next series, unless we change our minds, should be the war in Vietnam and the Russian Civil War. Going forward, we're going to try out some new things, and we'll experiment to some degree probably. With that in mind, we're very open to input and suggestions. If you like these videos, give a like and a share. Feel free to tell us about what you think, or any suggestions you might have in the comments. You can find us on YouTube, Podbean, and SoundCloud, at least part of our catalogs, and you can follow us for updates on Twitter, at The History Hour. If you have any other platforms you'd like to see us on, let us know that too. Tune in next time. Same history time, same history channel. All right, everybody, congratulations for sticking around after the credits. Welcome to the lightning round, where we just shove in some more random things that didn't really fit with the flow of the main episode. Sargon II, one of the more famous kings of the Neo-Assyrian period, conquered Babylon. In fact, was one of the first Assyrian kings to achieve this. But you wouldn't actually know how difficult it was if you just read his own report. Because he claims he attacked Babylon, defeated it, conquered it, no trouble whatsoever. In reality, it took him ten years and two wars to do it. But, upon his final victory over the Babylonians, around the year 710 BCE, he had all the official records, both in his own kingdom and the one he just conquered, changed to eliminate any reference to his own defeat. In fact, we only know this because in 720, when they actually defeated him, Initially, the Babylonians commissioned a great clay cylinder in which they inscribed the account of their victorious battle against him, which they had, of course, in the Temple of Marduk as an you know, offering of thanks to the gods. Well, Sargon had this stolen and replaced with his own version that has no account on it. The original was buried into the temple. Now, why they didn't just smash it, we don't know. Maybe he thought, well, maybe you don't want to piss Marduk off, but we find the original, which lines up with some other accounts we have, and, well, it turns out that propaganda misinformation and outright lying to your subjects and your chroniclers is by no means a new phenomenon. Which is an interesting thing because as we've discussed before, the idea of objective history wasn't actually so much a impetus in this era since everyone with enough of an education had a high level status in society to actually read or to write it down. And so so much of this was dictated directly by who the monarch was. So when we go to the earlier periods where records are even more scant, who knows how much those are even telling the truth. So, now with the Assyrians behind us, I think a fun little thing to look back upon was, out of all the tyrants who made pillars of heads and chopped people up and washed mountains red with people's blood, what, which of the Assyrians was truly the most violent? Certainly the granddaddy of them all, 
Oser Nazarfal, who kind of began the process of violent retribution, tried very, very hard to crown himself as psychopath in chief. But there's other kings that may well have surpassed him. But out of all the various quotes we've read on this program and in general, I think those from Snashrib seem just a touch more psychopathic, a touch more violent and horrific than all the rest. One of them in particular reads, I cut their throats like lambs. I cut off their precious lives as one cuts a string. Like the many waters of a storm, I made the contents of their gullets and their entrails run down upon the wide earth. My prancing steeds harnessed for my riding plunged into streams of their blood as into a river. The wheels of my war chariot, which brought low the wicked and the evil, were be splattered with blood and filth. With the bodies of the warriors I filled the plains like grass. Their testicles I cut off and tore out their privates like the seeds of cucumbers. You know, in a book we'd call that over the top and unrealistic. In history though, it's just kind of a Neo-Assyrian period. When you look at the last couple major events in Mesopotamian history, the changing of power, as it were, the Babylonians kind of portrayed themselves as this altruistic force taking from the Assyrians and making a new, better world as unpopular as that seems to be. But the Persians seem to have a bit more success, and they didn't say so explicitly, but very much the rhetoric they use reminds me of the good old-fashioned, and then they will grace as liberators. It reminds me of a thing I read many years ago, the war nerd, Gary Brecher. He had a line when he was regarding the war in Iraq where he said, any military plan that includes the step, and then they will grace as liberators, should immediately be dismissed out of hand. That, of course, being a reference to both the first and second Gulf Wars where they claimed that would happen. And it miraculously didn't. Throughout history, there are a few other examples you can see where even if nations aren't explicitly talking about being liberators, you can kind of see the same trend in play. For example, when Alexander the Great led his expedition to topple the Persian Empire, the Greeks had a great deal of rhetoric about the tyrannical Persian state and how the freedom-loving Greeks had a duty to overthrow it. Which, of course, in reality, they overthrew a admittedly authoritarian state and replaced it with another authoritarian state. The Romans never explicitly, that I can recall, spoke of themselves as liberators. But they often talk to themselves in a very heroic light of toppling these barbarian tribal peoples and surrounding monarchies and replacing them with the benefits of Roman civilization. One could argue they're one of the more successful in that regard, since by the time their empire did fall, it really wasn't internal tension that brought them down, but still, it's a very self-serving reason. The most famous example really comes from early modern history and the Napoleonic Wars. The coalitions that fought Napoleon, the, the Russians, the Prussians, the Austrians, and the British talked a lot about overthrowing Napoleonic tyranny. Not to say that Napoleon's government was a friendly, fun-loving, democratic government, but with the exception of maybe Great Britain, the coalition members weren't exactly themselves grand bastions of liberal thought. At least Napoleon let you vote if he got to be president for life. And, you know, later emperor for life. And even there, even though the coalitions were militarily successful, overthrew Napoleon, exiled him, reinstalled monarchs to their thrones, put the borders of Europe almost back where they used to be, and within 20 or 30 years, whole new waves of revolution break out and topple many of those monarchs, if only temporarily in some cases. Some nations are somewhat successful, others aren't. Why is it that a nation would have some success when it, quote, comes as a liberator to a land? Well, to me, it seems though often, whether it be Persian or some other society, when successful, it's often because in some fashion what they're, what this power is offering somebody is actually genuinely better than before and genuinely good for some degree. For example, the Babylonians claimed that, that they were you know, liberators from the Assyrian yoke and the brutal tyrants which had held the world in its sway, but people weren't really having the Babylonians as their grand overlords. Part of that could be connected to a trend we see often in history where an authoritarian state, a state which has been repressive and violent, maybe military imperialistic, will begin to open itself up to some reforms, and seemingly that only leads to it being a sort of opening the floodgates to revolts, to counter-government activities, that sort of thing. It seems to me that when you compare, say, the opening and the reforming of some of the systems of the Tsarist Russians, which were 
quite tyrannical in comparison even to their autocratic monarch neighbors. That's quite a different thing when comparing to, say, the Romans with the sort of advantages that civilization would have. All of a sudden, when you've gone from an illiterate serf in Russia, but now you're aware of, you know, how bad your nation really kind of has in comparison to the rest of the world, well, you're likely to be chomping at the bit for even more. And when those systems, whether they be Russian czarists or whether they be Neo-Babylonian emperors are unwilling to bend to those rules or still desiring to keep you as a second-class citizen, be it because you're from a minority community or be it because you might be a peasant from the lower working classes, then that's just a recipe for revolt or violence. Mesopotamia is a hotbed of a modern problem we see throughout these main areas. One of revolution, revolt, of infighting. We see this Greece liberators narrative and the revolts and the fighting and the repressions thereof in the Assyrian era, but we've been talking about that happening since at least the Akkadian Empire, and surely some of the violence in the Uruk period when they were attempting to expand might have been somewhat a result of that. When we look at these contrasts, this clear imperialism and colonial contrast to the reform and revolution of the conquered peoples, it raises a question. Why exactly are people willing to fight and to die in order to gain independence for their city, in order to fight these conquering empires? Throughout the time we've looked at it, much of this occurs in periods of weakness. When empires are unable to perhaps provide for these cities, but often very likely simply cannot hold them in line, the urge to resist arises. But why is that say different from modern context? If you look at say, the 2008 financial recession. There was no revolt where California broke away and tried to establish the Empire of Sacramento. There was no League of City-States that broke away and refused to acknowledge the authority of Washington. When you have a system where imperialism, colonialism, are the primary modus operandi of expansionism, it is inherently, by definition, a system whereby those people incorporated are not entirely afforded the same rights as those in the center. The whole system is built to derive power, to extract wealth, to do whatever it needs to do to bolster the situation of the monarch, and by some extension, the monarch's city and its people. These Mesopotamians, whether it be city-states, whether it be the various tribes, they have shown over the many centuries a willingness to fight and die for the cause of self-determination, the cause of self-government. A cause that, obviously, we've seen many times in modern history. To an American audience, the obvious analog is the Revolutionary War, but surely you can also draw comparisons between the French Revolution and numerous decolonial struggles throughout the 20th century. So, when we look at these terms of things like Greece as liberators, it's easy to understand why it might be hard to be genuinely seen as that, especially if, in reality, when you arrive, it's not to give the people of this new region, the country, the city, state, whatever it is, it's not to give them equal representation at the table. It's not to give them 100% full rights and an equal slice of the pie in the new force. It's not to simply prop up the city and rebuild it as great as it once was. Usually, usually it is to make it simply an extension of a new empire, an extension of a new sphere of influence. And in fact, you know, there's famous examples even of, say, in World War II, when the Allies returned to Germany and liberated Paris, the Americans and the British stopped to let the French go through the gate first because they realized the power of optics was strong, that the French might not be quite so happy, even if it was an Allied army, to see those armies and those generals gallivanting through, claiming to be liberators, and instead they let the Gaul have the credit for it because they figured that will make our sort of greed as liberators initiative all the more legitimate. Of course, much of the modern narrative of the idea of a liberation war really does arise in this post-World War II era. A lot of it has to do with the Cold War and America's containment efforts against the Soviet Union or what it saw as the global communist threat. And I suspect rose-tinted glasses from the liberation of Germany and Italy and Japan from fascism and there was some legitimate attempts to build a better society in those nations after the war led many nations, but the United States primarily, to intervene across the globe to prevent what it either saw, either in reality or it claimed to see, as communist repression and colonialism. 
But in so doing, it was essentially interfering with the rights of nations and individuals to self-government. It was often propping up brutal regimes to serve really global strategic interests rather than real local interests. And so these wars became liberation wars in name only and were often seen and greeted quite hostily by those who they were ostensibly trying to protect. In many of the conflicts throughout the Cold War, it's telling to note that who was supplying and backing the supposed revolutionaries and freedom fighters entirely varied by which region you're talking about. While the Americans might prop up individuals fighting for self-determination, trying to liberate some group, there were equally many socialist slash communist groups armed and backed by the Soviets or Cuba or other entities or the Chinese who did the same throughout the Cold War. So it raises the question of why why are these people willing to fight in all these different ways and willing to accept all the different assistance wherever it may come or willing to fight in what could possibly be a hopeless struggle or at the very least a struggle that would take years and many lives to see fulfilled. Well, in a real way, I feel it's a human initiative. It's a human impetus to when you find yourself inside an unfair system in an oppressed role to wish to lash out. In most of history, that is meant militarily. After all, there's the famous cases of nonviolent resistance, which were quite significant throughout the, the American Civil Rights era, and I'm sure throughout many other countries. But if you look back to medieval times, if you look back to likely most even early modern period, that sort of resistance and speaking out against those in power, unless it came from those equally in lofty positions in society, were likely simply to be met with violence itself, whether it be the king's men or the secret police or what have you. Throughout most of history, the only option you had, if you were, say, some Ur nationalist who desperately wanted to see your city or perhaps your region, the sea land, succeed, there was no sending a petition to the Assyrian emperor. There was no hunger striking outside the gates of Nimrud. The Assyrian emperor would have just laughed, maybe had your skin played off, and gone back to wherever he was doing. The option largely becomes one of armed hostilities. In a real way, I think it's very easy to understand if you put yourself in those shoes. If you imagine yourself in a society, wherever it may be, obviously some modern societies, the Uyghurs in China, or say the Kurds in the Middle East, if you can imagine yourself as one of those groups, or perhaps if your society, your population, your culture was put into a position like that, some massive domineering outside military imposed itself upon you and said that your place in society was not as valuable, that your role as a human being is not as important, that you are in effect, even if not officially, but certainly sometimes so, a second class citizen, it's very easy to understand the resentment you might have. After all, these struggles we've seen, the revolutions, the fights for independence, the decolonial struggles, the guerrilla campaigns waged against vastly larger and more powerful and wealthy and well-equipped enemies, they're done largely for the same reason each time. The desire to build a better future for you and for your children, or at least the people in your society and their children. So one thing that I think often stands out to students I've taught, and which more than a few have commented on over the years, is just how strange and unusual ancient names seem to be to modern listeners. And to be fair, these names would have been perfectly ordinary at the time, no doubt. But even so, even to modern audiences, if, but a few stand out as, to me at least, particularly amusing to modern ears. I imagine during the course of our several episodes, you have heard me struggle with the pronunciation of many names. And while the next two projects we're moving on to are supposed to be Russian Vietnamese, I imagine there will be no lack of mispronunciation of those either. To be perfectly fair to my colleague, we're not 100% sure how they're pronounced at all, really. Hint, see the Caesar Caesar controversy over Latin. But of the many strange names from the thousands of years of history we're dealing with, I think there are certainly a few that stand out as stranger and more incomprehensible than the rest. From the pre-dynastic period alone, we have Insha Kushana of Uruk, Lugal Unimundu of Adab, and Urzababa. You can guess what city he's from. There are a few others from other areas, such as Inlil Kudu Usur, or Iti Marduk Balutu, or Marduk Zakir Shumi. Later periods give us figures like Tukulti Nyanurta, Marduk Zakir Shumi, Palushu, Mushzib Marduk, and on and on. 
Out of the various groups, though, I think the Cassites and the Elamites probably take the cake in just generally being weird to pronounce. Like, Absolutely. Some of my favorite Cassite names are Bernaburiash, Castiliash, Karaindash, Shagarakti Shuriash, or Nazi Muhurtash. Like, who knows? Those may be vaguely correctly pronounced. They like the word Ash, don't they? Though, though, I think the Elamite name of Shutruk Nanut is my favorite. Though, upon looking at that name, I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing it correctly, or at least pronouncing it correctly from the way it's spelled. Because some have it as K there, and I think I was putting an extra in anyway. So it's likely pronounced Shutruk Nahunti, or Shutruk Nakhunti. Though, one of the ones I think I found the most incomprehensible was Marduk Zair X. It's Marduk... Dash Zare, at least I'm pretty sure that's pronounced Zare, it looks that way. Dash X. Not EX, not EKS, just an X. I'm not sure how they think we should pronounce that, or how the Babylonians of the time thought we pronounce it, but that's apparently his name. Marduk Zare X. But of all the of all the various names I've seen, probably the strangest, most I'm not sure this is how I should pronounce it, and also, why do you have that name? Probably came from the Sea Land, who may have the longest single name I've seen on the list. Peshgold Areshmesh. Not dashes, not spaces, just one big long Peshgold Areshmesh. That's that dude's name. Like, and even as late as the Chaldean Neo Babylonian period, they were still getting into the act with kings like Nabu Apa Usur and Nabu Kuduri Usur. How the Greeks got Nebuchadnezzar out of that, I don't know. It's a funny thing, too, because you see these names flipped around. As uh, as already been mentioned, there's Tukulti Ninurta. But then a few generations, you see someone being called Ninurta Tukulti Ashur. Which, you know, since Ashur is their god slash city, to put this in a somewhat modern context, if any of you were familiar with Illinois politics, it'd be kind of the equivalent of a mayor being so prominent that, you know, his name might be Richard Daly, but a few generations down, maybe a hundred years later, someone deciding to harken back to those days would instead call himself Daly Richard Chicago. A lot of these names they tend to shove in stuff like Marduk or in Leolin. It'd be sort of like Bill Jesus de Blasio or something like Jehovah Rudy Giuliani Brooklyn. It's this sort of way uh, naming conventions work back then. If it hasn't been done already, I imagine someday someone or multiple someones will make a doctorate or at least a master's off of just endless studies of, well, this king seems to be named this ti- this thing at this time, and it indicates that maybe the syntax has somewhat changed, but historiographically, this era of Assyrians or this era of Babylonians are looking back at this period, and we could tell that they were, Bahrain had awareness of this period because of this name. This is the sort of thing we're dealing with. We have all these crazy names on a page and a bunch of old buried ruins. Though, I will admit, of all the crazy names, I think a few are pretty awesome. So, if you want the official History Hour advice, or at least the official Mr. Ken advice, if you're maybe an expected parent or you're thinking about maybe having kids someday, go full classic. Don't name your kid a Victorian name. Don't name your kid even a medieval name or something out of old, maybe antiquity. For example, I had a neighbor who named his sons Magnus, Alexander, Gabriel, and Titus. Just go go beyond. If, if you're having a son, or whom I judge, a daughter even, consider naming that kid maybe Nebuchadnezzar, Kurigalzu, Shamshiadad, Shalmanezer, or maybe take a Flazer. I mean, other than your kid being completely lost in first grade or kindergarten or whatever it is when they try to teach a child to spell their own name, you know, everyone will realize how awesome that name is. It will totally make up for how much they're picked on. And let's be perfectly honest, it would not even be in the top ten strangest names I've seen on my rosters. 